Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, the full jury seated in former President Trump's New York criminal trial. What we know about the unexpectedly speedy conclusion, what Trump said outside the courthouse, and what's next. Arlene Richards brings us the latest. President Biden gets endorsements from members of the Kennedy family, all while independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is threatening to spoil Biden's campaign. Iris Tao on Biden's campaign trial in Pennsylvania. The House Republican Conference is divided over Speaker Johnson's foreign aid plan. Luis Martinez brings us reactions from lawmakers for and against the latest proposal from Capitol Hill. And the new foreign aid package is being bundled with a bill that would force TikTok to divest from its Chinese parent company. Congress expected to decide on the platform's fate this week. Jack Bradley with more on the bill that has the support of President Biden. This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City. Here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. A full jury is now seated in the New York criminal trial of former President Trump. It's a plot twist after two of the previously selected jurors were dismissed earlier today. Trump just spoke on his way out of the courtroom. Here's what he said. I wanted to just say that I'm supposed to be in New Hampshire. I'm supposed to be in Georgia. I'm supposed to be in North Carolina, South Carolina. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning. But I've been here all day uh, on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. Uh, D.A. Bragg wants us to believe that his pursuit of Trump isn't political. Of course it's political. And they're doing it for Biden. They're doing this for Joe Biden. We turn now to our legal correspondent Arlene Richards for the latest. Arlene, what can you tell us about this latest development? Well, as you said, 12 persons were picked today for the jury and one alternate. Uh, this, there was a setback this morning a little earlier where two jurors were dismissed. One of them uh, was concerned about the, the media talking about her identity and another one uh, the prosecutor was concerned that this person had a past history that he didn't reveal so the 12 jurors will will be the ones to decide the fate of the president uh, the one alternate will be joined by five others which they will continue to select those on friday uh, also the judge said that he will um, not allow the attorneys to take off for Passover. One of them said that he needed to take off Tuesday. The judge said that he will be requiring them to be in the courtroom until 2 p.m. Now, as far as the jurors are concerned, I have to look at my notes here. Uh, I did find out about some of their backgrounds. Now, the five jurors that remain from the first seven, um, two of them were lawyers. One is a salesman and he is the foreman. There was an English teacher and a software engineer. Now today they picked out uh, seven more jurors, uh, two replacing the two that left and then five more after that. One of them is a woman working for a multinational apparel company, a physical therapist, a retired wealth manager, a speech therapist, retail employee, investment banker, and a security engineer. So there's a wide range of people there. I think they're of different ages and races. Um, so there will be a, um, a mixture of, of jurors to decide his fate. But I do want to point out that the Trump team used up all of their strikes. So they tried to get some of the jurors removed for cause, what's called for cause. And they have to get the judge's permission for that. And the judge denied it. Hmm. Now, Trump did have the day off on Wednesday, but the prosecution didn't rest. Tell us about their court filing. So they were preparing for what's called a Sandoval hearing, which the judge said he will have tomorrow. And this is where the prosecutor has to tell the judge what kind of bad acts of the defendant they're going to bring up if the defendant gets on the stand. So they say they're going to ask the defendant, which is Donald Trump, going to ask him about the two most recent trials, the E. Jean Carroll trial and the civil fraud trial, both of which had huge verdicts. And then they're also going to talk about uh, his lawsuit that he filed against Hillary Clinton, which was dismissed as being frivolous. And there were two other lawsuits, one against his foundation and one against his company. They will ask him about all of these things if he decides to go on the stand. Now, he did say that he would go on the stand, but I think um, they may rethink this after finding out what the prosecution is going to go after. 
Now the prosecution made a separate filing about the gag order. What was the discussion in the courtroom this morning about that? Yeah, so they're saying that Trump has violated seven more times this gag order and mostly in comments that he's making about Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen is the prosecutor's star witness who has a history of lying. He's been convicted for lying. Um, and they said that uh, Trump also posted this morning something from Jesse Waters from Fox News, uh, a quote from him saying that there were hidden uh, uh, liberal activists on the jury that are, are lying to the judge and they said that this is also a violation of the gag order. Now the judge didn't make a decision about this this morning but the Trump's attorneys said that the reason why he's commenting on Cohen is because he's responding to things that Cohen had said about him and that it's political and they've argued in, past, in the past that political speech is protected by the First Amendment. Not sure how the judge is going to rule on that but we'll probably find that out in the days to come, maybe tomorrow. Arlene, thanks for those updates. Thank you. On the third day of his campaign trip in Pennsylvania, President Biden is receiving endorsements from the Kennedy family. That says a third party wild card Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running a campaign that could tip the 2024 election to former President Trump. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more from Philadelphia. Over a dozen members of the Kennedy family endorsed President Biden at his campaign event right here in Philadelphia. And that's a rebuke to one of their own, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and the independent candidate whom Biden's campaign worries could take votes away from President Biden and tip the 2024 elections toward former President Trump. Both Biden and Kerry Kennedy, one of RFK Jr.'s sisters, directing their fire not so much at RFK Jr. himself, but at the ultimate target, Trump. I can only imagine how Donald Trump's outrageous lies and behavior would have horrified my father. Daddy stood for equal justice, for human rights, and freedom from want and fear, just as President Biden does today. And President Biden again doubling down on portraying former President Trump as a threat to democracy, citing some comments by Trump that Trump said were often taken out of context. And as mentioned already, he promised to be a dictator on day one, his own words. And he calls for another bloodbath when he loses again. Meanwhile, RFK Jr. responded to his family's new endorsements for Biden, saying he's pleased to see it as it shows that people like he and his family can still be divided in opinions, but united in love for each other. He further used it to promote his campaign message of, quote, healing America. And Trump, meanwhile, has called RFK Jr. a radical left, citing his views on climate change and abortion. So RFK Jr. is polling at 13 percent in a Fox News poll last month, proving that he can still be a threat to both candidates, or like himself put it early last month, that he wants his campaign to be a spoiler for both Biden and Trump. Reporting from Philadelphia, Iris Tao, NTD News. House Republicans are divided over House Speaker Mike Johnson's foreign aid plan, with a vote expected as soon as this Saturday. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez brings us the latest. It's been over 60 days since the Senate approved its $95 billion supplemental aid package for Israel, Taiwan and Ukraine. Since then, House Republican leaders had drawn a line that they would not consider any foreign aid unless border security was addressed first. Now, Speaker Johnson is under fire for presenting a foreign aid package without border security provisions. Uh, so I'm disappointed that we're not putting border security. It's a huge problem. Are you, you going to vote in favor of Ukraine aid? I don't sure yet. It depends what is going to end up. I support only lethal aid. I spoke with Congressman Eric Burleson, the Republican from Missouri, and he said he would not support the Speaker's plan unless H.R. 2, the border security bill that passed the House of Representatives last year, is included in the package. House Resolution 2 or H.R. 2, if that bill was fully on the Ukraine supplemental, I would consider it. The American people deserve to know where, where their lawmakers stand where their senators stand when it comes to their position on the border. Some House Republicans, like Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene or Congressman Tom Massey, have asked the Speaker to either resign or face a motion to vacate. Others, like Representative Van Orden or Representative Mike Waltz, have defended the Speaker on strategic grounds. The obstructionist, the minority of the minority of the Republican Party, better pay attention because we're over it. We are done. We came here to govern. We came here to legislate. A lot of those folks came here to get on television. Now is the absolute wrong time to send the House into chaos. 
Right. Some Freedom Caucus members have also rejected the idea of increasing the threshold needed to activate a motion to vacate the speakership. Currently, only one congressman is needed to activate a motion to oust Speaker Johnson. I'm opposed to that. The speaker serves at the pleasure of the membership. A strong, confident leader is not concerned about being in that position. Speaker Johnson has already expressed that he expects support from Democrats in order to move his plan forward. I don't have all my Republicans who agree on that rule, and that means the only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. It is expected that the House of Representatives will vote on four standalone legislations this Saturday. A bill for Ukraine, a bill for Israel, a bill for Taiwan, and a fourth bill containing Republican priorities. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The new House foreign aid package is being bundled with a bill that would force TikTok to divest from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance. NTD's Jack Bradley has more from the State Department. The House is set to vote on an aid package that would require TikTok to divest from its Chinese parent company or be banned from U.S. app stores. Now, it's being bundled with Ukraine and Israel aid that's set to clear the chamber this week. In a post on X Wednesday night, TikTok said, quote, it is unfortunate that the House of Representatives is using the cover of important foreign and humanitarian assistance to once again jam through a ban bill that would trample the free speech of 170 million Americans, devastate 7 million businesses, and shutter a platform. An earlier version of the TikTok bill had already cleared the House last month. President Biden has promised to sign the bill if it reaches his desk. This comes amid TikTok's intent intense lobbying of lawmakers on Capitol Hill and its 170 million users in the U.S. to push back against this bill. TikTok is under scrutiny because Chinese law requires TikTok and other companies based in China to hand over user data to the regime, allowing ready access to Americans' personal information by the Chinese Communist Party. The current version of the bill would give ByteDance about a year to sell TikTok or face the ban. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley NTD News. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas back in action on Capitol Hill today. This just a day after the Senate rejected articles of impeachment against him. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testified before the Senate Homeland Security Committee on Thursday. This just a day after senators discovered that the alleged killer of nursing student Lakin Riley was released into the U.S. on parole after crossing the border illegally. So this is your policies in action, Mr. Secretary. A criminal is permitted into this country on grounds flatly not permitted, flatly contradictory to the statute. He commits a crime against a child, and then he gets a work permit. He gets a work permit. The senator suggested the suspect never should have gotten the permit due to his history, also saying that that's part of the reason why many Americans can't find a job. Then in February, he commits the heinous crime against Lake and Riley. Is this a record that you are proud of? Um, uh, Senator, um, you've misstated some facts. I have read from the parole file, which you have said you don't recall, don't have, you miscited. I'm reading from it. It is right here. Mayorkas appeared as a witness to answer questions about his department's budget request, but most Republicans focused on his handling of the southern border. Republicans argue that Mayorkas is a big reason why over 7 million people enter the U.S. illegally during the Biden administration so far. Democrats say that instead of impeaching Mayorkas, Republicans should have accepted a border bill which came out of the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, I have many colleagues who like to talk about solving a problem but would much rather just throw rocks. It's just so much easier to throw rocks than actually solve the problem. The House is not picking that bill up. They argue it would only allocate more money to the border without actually changing the current situation. A high school student in Lexington, North Carolina, was reportedly suspended for using the term illegal alien in class. The student's mother told the Carolina Journal that her son attends Central Davidson High School. She said his English teacher assigned the word alien during a vocabulary assignment on Tuesday. The mother said her son was trying to understand the assignment and asked his teacher, like space aliens or illegal aliens. Another boy in the class was reportedly offended by the question and threatened to fight him. The incident prompted the teacher to get the assistant principal involved in the matter. The administrative staff deemed the words illegal aliens to be disrespectful and offensive and suspended the student for three days. The story has since gained widespread attention on social media. 
The office of Davidson County School Superintendent told the Epic Times the district could not provide information regarding student matters. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Chaos broke out at Columbia University earlier today as NYPD officers began to arrest anti-Israeli protesters who camped on campus grounds. This video posted by Stop Anti-Semitism shows a protester openly supporting Hamas. We are Hamas! You're Hamas? Wow. That's a good one. You're what? You're Hamas? Columbia students began the so-called Gaza Solidarity Encampment yesterday as the university's president testified in Congress on the school's response to anti-Semitism. Many of the anti-Israeli protesters had camped overnight. The Columbia president said the encampment violates university rules and asked the NYPD today for help in breaking it up. Videos show anti-Israeli protesters clashing with police and some had lit small fires. Dozens of students were detained, but it is not yet clear whether they're facing any charges. At least 200 protesters who refused to leave moved to an area about two blocks away from the school campus. Barnard College suspended at least three students for refusing to leave the encampment. One of them is Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's daughter, Isra Hirsi. She's an organizer with a pro-Palestinian student group. She was also reportedly arrested earlier today. Joining me now to discuss the student protests at Columbia University is Michelle Adud, Director of Programming and Strategy at End Jew Hatred. Michelle, thanks for joining us. What is your reaction to the nature and scale of this protest? Well, you know, at this point, I'm not even going to say disbelief because the nature and scale of this protest is a direct, direct consequence of the lack of accountability and consequences that have been imposed on these pro-Hamas protesters since October 7th at Columbia University. Now, the president of Columbia University says all students participating in the encampment will be suspended for violating a long list of school rules and policies. Do these consequences get to the heart of the issue that sparked this incident? Well, this is just the beginning. These are the consequences that we have been asking. Ends Jew Hatred as a civil rights movement. We, our goal is to embrace, for everybody to embrace the minority rights of Jewish people. We rallied at Columbia in October with these specific demands asking from October for professors at Columbia that are spewing the fact that October 7th was exhilarating and awesome. Professors such as that, such as Mossad, should not be teaching at Columbia. But President Shafiq did not do anything much at all to impose any accountability or consequences. Students are hurting, students are scared, and we need, we need to see a change, drastic systemic change on campus. To your point, many Ivy League schools like Columbia University has seen numerous anti-Israel protests since the October 7th attack. Just yesterday, the school's president was accused of gross negligence while testifying before Congress about anti-Semitic incidents at the school and pro-Palestinian yes. indoctrination. How are Jewish students feeling on these campuses? Is enough being done to protect Jewish students from anti-Semitism? Sadly, not at all. Students are feeling scared. Students are terrified to walk across the quad wearing a Jewish star around their neck. It's a terrible, terrible campus culture. Not enough is being done. In this situation, I think that Colombia's president had a bit more coaching than the president's uh, beginning of December during the congressional hearings had. But coaching and being able to finally answer what is hate speech that we know is hate speech is one thing. Coaching is one thing, but seeing direct results and consequences is another. And unfortunately, students have not seen anything. The Jewish students have not been heard. We have been rallying for them. We held a rally just yesterday, a peaceful rally outside the Columbia gates, specifically asking for consequences and for our students, all of the Jewish community's rights to be upheld, because sadly they have not been at all up until this point. Michelle Adu, Director of Programming and Strategy at NGU Hatred, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.
At the United Nations, a resolution that would pave the way for Palestine to become a full member failed to pass in the Security Council. This is after the U.S. used its veto power. Twelve members in the bloc voted in favor of the resolutions, but one voted against, and there were two who voted abstentions. The U.S. said, quote, premature actions in New York, even with the best intentions, will not achieve statehood for the Palestinian people. And that Palestinian membership in the U.N. needs to be the outcome of the negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians. Palestine is currently a non-member observer at the U.N. Becoming a full member would mean the U.N. was effectively recognizing a Palestinian state. Israel's defense minister says Israel is being attacked on seven different fronts and that Israel has the right to do what it wants. Meanwhile, an Iranian general said there could be significant consequences if Iran's nuclear facilities are targeted. Entity's Jason Perry has the update. The Hezbollah terrorist group in Lebanon released this video claiming to show Wednesday's drone attack that injured 14 Israeli soldiers who were sleeping inside this community center in northern Israel. Hezbollah said the attack was payback for Israel killing a number of its fighters on the previous day. This woman in Israel who lives near the Lebanese border said this on Thursday about the attack. We live on the border. We are in fear. Our children went into shock, in shock. What can we do? Also on Thursday, Israel Defense Forces reported striking several Hezbollah terror targets overnight in Lebanon. Meanwhile, the IDF continues pushing forward with its mission to defeat the Hamas terrorist group in the Gaza Strip, uncovering tunnels and then destroying them. And over the past week, the IDF reported killing 40 terrorists and striking over 100 terror targets in the Gaza Strip. This displaced Palestinian resident reacted to an apparent Israeli airstrike. More than 15 people, and we still do not know who was sleeping here. Also, the ones we pulled out, we do not know who they are. Israel's defense minister on Thursday said Israel is being attacked from seven different fronts and that Israel has the freedom of action to do what it wants. And while Israel continues to battle Iran-backed terrorist groups, Israel is also preparing to possibly strike Iran itself. Israel's prime minister met with officials in the Mossad, Israel's equivalent to the CIA, and he said this. We are committed also to defeating the terrorist axis in Gaza, to freeing the hostages, and to repelling the overall threat coming from Iran. And Iran on Thursday said if Israel targets Iran's nuclear facilities, then Iran would target Israel's nuclear facilities as well. Meanwhile, in Israel... Passover won't be the same this year, as family members of the more than 100 hostages still held in the Gaza Strip find it hard to celebrate the occasion while their family members are still in captivity. And on Thursday, thousands of people marched in Tel Aviv, urging the Israeli government to reach a ceasefire deal with the Hamas terrorist group to release the hostages. Jason Perry, NTD News. Joining me now to discuss Israel's response to the attack from Iran is Israeli parliament member Amit Halimi. He's a member of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. Amit Halimi, thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you on the show. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Now, following Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel over the weekend, in your view, what is Israel's next move and how do we prevent a further regional war? Okay, in order to prevent uh, a further uh, war, I think the main goal, not only on Israel's shoulders, but uh, the whole Western world, is to actually to take off the, this Iranian regime. I think the people of Iran uh, must have uh, liberation from this uh, regime, which actually, as, you, as, as we all saw uh, last week, I mean, it's not only... Uh, dangerous for the Middle East. It's uh, also for the whole world. And I think it's about time that uh, the, the Western world will face the reality, will understand who is this enemy 
that we we face uh, it's not from today i mean the the radical muslims not only uh, uh, in tehran also in pakistan and also in gaza and other places and we must fight not only the you know the military dimension also the ideological dimension and the real mission of our generation is to take off the ayatollah regime in iran we have seen the U.S. and the international community calling for Israel to have restraint when it comes to responding to Iran. Now, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that Israel will make its own decision when it comes to that response. Now, in your assessment, what would happen if Israel does not take a military action against Iran? Look, Israel must respond because we cannot allow, we cannot afford ourselves this equation that uh, you know, uh, Iran is launching hundreds of missiles against us, and uh, although the very impressive uh, defense that we presented uh, in, in the recent days, uh, it's not enough. I mean, we mu Iran must understand that this type of uh, terror activities cannot uh, go, and you know, we cannot treat it like and nothing like everything is usual so that's why israel must respond over more than 20 years this octopus named iran actually developed all its proxies around israel and he has target and the target is as i said it's not only jerusalem and washington it's also mecca this is on the table of the leaders of tehran and that's why besides our response which should be painful response for the Iranian uh, regime, we must put on the table and uh, on the public discourse in the uh, United States and in Europe that we must, uh, uh, you know, uh, come together in order to do the real war. And the real war should be taking off the Iranian regime. Now, the U.S. today placed new sanctions on Iran's drone program following the attack over the weekend. What further action does the U.S. need to take in terms to stabilize and subdue Iran in the region? Two things. First of all, the sanctions that were declared today must be expanded. I mean, uh, we must uh, first of all go back to the sanctions that were in, uh, you know, the last administration uh, in the States. That will be very important pressure on the Iranian regime because the Iranian people uh, uh, feel very well the, uh, those sanctions and there will be, you know, bottom-up pressure in uh, the, the state of Iran and that's why it's very, very important to make these sanctions as needed. And second, to make several activities with people, include Iranian people, in Iran and out of Iran, we should take care of the liberation of the Iranian people, not less than other people. They are also under occupation of this uh, uh, extremist, uh, uh, extremist regime. Ahmed Halevi, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. The full jury is selected in former President Trump's hush money trial. Two jurors were dismissed today, but seven more were seated and one alternate. Tomorrow, the rest of the alternates will be selected. Outside of the court, Trump said he ought to be out campaigning. House Republican leaders have decided to move forward with a $95 billion foreign aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. A vote is expected as soon as this Saturday. This is despite opposition from conservatives within the GOP. Chaos broke out at Columbia University as police broke up an anti-Israeli encampment and arrested dozens of protesters. Among them was Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's daughter. Joining me now to discuss the current conflicts in the Middle East is retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Robert Spaulding. He's also a former senior director of White House National Security Council Strategic Planning. General Spaulding, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks. Great to be back. 
Now, the world is watching how Israel will respond after Iran's unprecedented attack over the weekend. Now, the U.S. is slapping new sanctions on Iran's drone program. How has U.S. deterrence or lack of in the international standing contributed to what we saw Iran do? Well, I was really surprised that Iran would uh, directly attack Israel, and I think that goes to show just how far our um, ability to deter has fallen, and it's a, it's a it's a real tragedy and unfortunate, but it just demonstrates that we really haven't um, been on the ball when it comes to foreign policy or national security for a few years now. And does that go back to the withdrawal from Afghanistan, or what can we attribute this to? Well, I think it's a whole host of things. You know, we um, our response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has really just been woefully um, incomplete. And then, of course, you know, the Biden administration didn't follow through on the Abraham Accords. Um, you know, took the Houthis off the terror watch list, and you know, started sidling up to Iran. So there's so many things that, you know, across the board that we're just not doing properly. You know, we think that we can have relationships, friendly relationships with Iran and, and China and Russia, and they all just want to undermine, you know, and destabilize the world and make us suffer the consequences. And I think really in, for China, it's it's a way to, you know, burden us with all of these different things to keep our eyes off the Indo-Pacific region where they're, they are going to act uh, with impunity. I want to get to China later, but first, the U.S. has been calling on Israel to have restraint in its response to Iran's attack. Now, given all the tensions we are seeing around the world, what should the U.S. be doing? Well, I think, as I've said before, it's time for us to take stock about uh, of what we have uh, as a nation. Uh, we have to rebuild. We have to recapitalize our industrial base, our infrastructure. I don't think that we really have the resources available to really be involved in so many conflicts uh, far from our shores. And I think that's the unfortunate thing that has happened uh, in the uh, interim since the end of the Cold War, because we de-industrialized, we stopped investing in ourselves, and that really left us woefully unprepared to sustain any type of campaign against any of our adversaries. And so all we're doing right now is we're not, we're not really contributing all that much because we are so far behind the eight ball. And so I think it's time for us to rebuild and maybe take a pause. I'm not saying stopping supporting in terms of resources, but we need the rest of the free world to step up because, quite frankly, we're tapped out. Now, CNN ran an article this week titled, Can China Play a Role in Avoiding an All-Out War in the Middle East? What do you make of China's role in this conflict, especially in the terms of a mediator? Oh, they're goading. They're goading the Iranians into it. Um, they're supporting them. They have no. Uh, they have no interest in seeing the Middle East uh, stabilize again, because right now it's a, a huge distraction for the United States away from the Indo-Pacific. They have no interest in um, Russia stopping what it's doing in Ukraine. It actually benefits from those things not only in terms of financially, they're, because they're supporting each of those conflicts with resources, but it just keeps the United States pinned down and not focusing on uh, what China's doing. On that note, we have seen China giving Iran basically a lifeline by buying up a lot of Iranian oil, skirting those Western sanctions. Given that, how should China factor into a U.S. response when it comes to subduing Iran? Well, if we want to subdue Iran, we need to stop funding the Chinese who are in turn funding the Iranians. And it's the same goes with uh, Russia. It, that's the problem. We cut off Iran uh, from using financial sanctions, um, and then we released them when the Biden administration came in, but then we you know, put them back on on Russia when they invaded Ukraine. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what sanctions we put on these countries if they're able to just turn around and go to China and get whatever they want. And of course, China's, you know, connected to the global economy. So it's it's like, for instance, if we had done 
that with the Soviet Union, there is absolutely no way we could have won the uh, the first Cold War. And so as long as China's plugged in, we're going to be losing. General Spaulding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Has the world forgotten October 7th, Israel's 9-11? Kelly Wright traveled to Israel to speak to survivors and hostages family members. They vow never to forget as they combat anti-Semitism and fight for freedom. Watch Hope for Israel, an NTD News primetime special on Friday, April 26th at 10 p.m. Eastern here on NTD. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Public health agencies are warning that counterfeit Botox has been discovered in multiple states and is suspected to be connected to several individuals reporting bad reactions following the injections for cosmetic use. Entity's Christina Corona tells us more. The CDC and FDA have launched an investigation into fake Botox, which has resulted in 19 individuals being hospitalized due to bad reactions in nine states. The affected patients, all women ranging from their mid-20s to late 40s, all reported symptoms consistent with botulism. The symptoms can be a droopy eyelid, um, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, are all some of the risks that come along with getting counterfeit Botox. The hospitalized women also reported symptoms such as blurred vision and muscle weakness. According to the CDC, these illnesses occurred in patients who received Botox injections in non-medical settings or from untrained or unlicensed practitioners. I think it's really unfortunate that some people are willing to risk patients' health to give counterfeit Botox. Um, I think some patients don't know the seriousness or the complications that they could face by um, jeopardizing their health and getting counterfeit Botox. Botox uses a purified form of botulinum toxin, which temporarily paralyzes muscles to reduce wrinkles when injected into the face. The CDC noted that in several instances, patients received injections containing products from unverified sources. The FDA identified several ways to spot counterfeit Botox products, such as looking for lot numbers on the outer carton and vial, checking that the active ingredient is listed as botulinum toxin type A, ensuring that the package indicates 150 unit doses, and verifying that the outer carton doesn't contain non-English language. People who suspect counterfeit Botox products are encouraged to file a report with the FDA. Christina Corona, NTD News, Chino Hills. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin at the Sports Hub. Now, Dave, plenty to discuss today, but let's start in the NHL, where the Arizona Coyotes may have played their last home game in the desert. Why are they reportedly on the move to Utah? Yeah, it's a lack of arena. I mean, currently they're playing their home game at home games at Arizona State University's uh, stadium, uh, Mullet Arena, but it only seats 5,000 people. That's very small. That's like the third of the size of an NHL arena. And they've been doing that for the past two years now. Now, this is going to be an unusual move to Utah, similar to when the NFL's Cleveland Browns moved to Baltimore and became the Ravens. And then a couple years ago, they were reborn with a new owner. Now, reportedly, the Arizona Coyotes will be sold to Ryan Smith, who already owns the Utah Jazz. He would relocate the team to Utah, but the Coyotes' previous owner would have the option to essentially reactivate the team as a new franchise if he secures a new arena in Arizona within the next five years. So a lot is still up in the air here. Looking at college sports, the state of Virginia has passed a law that will allow schools to directly pay their student athletes for their name, image and likeness. How impactful could this be? I think it's huge. I mean, I think this is going to force the NCAA's hand, you know, one way or the other here. Currently, the NCAA prohibits schools from paying their student athletes for their name, image and likeness or NAL. This Virginia law makes it illegal for the NCAA to punish Virginia schools to pay their athletes for NIL. At the very least, it would give Virginia schools a huge recruiting advantage over every other, every other school. Now, I think it'll be very interesting to see the NCAA's response here. Do they still try to penalize Virginia schools? Should one of them actually pay their players and then see what the courts decide? It'll also be telling if other states do the same in response. I mean, no schools want to be at a disadvantage here. Now, this law goes into effect on July 1st. I would think we'll see a domino effect here starting probably very soon. 
Shifting gears to the NBA, the league's play-in tournament is halfway through. What would you say has been some of the biggest developments thus far? You know, there's only been a four, four games so far, but kind of a lot has happened. I would say the biggest uh, development that we've seen is going to be this Lakers Nuggets rematch here right in round one. Now this is a rematch of last year's conference finals where the Nuggets actually swept them in what everybody thought would be a very close series. The Nuggets swept them en route to winning the NBA title. We'll have to see what happens this time though. Now another thing in the Western Conference is this New Orleans team. Now New Orleans lost to the Lakers. The Lakers got the seventh seed that was on Tuesday night. New Orleans is not out though as the loser. They still play Sacramento Friday night with the winner getting the eighth seed. But they will be without two-time all-star Zion Williamson who hurt, his, who hurt his leg in the loss. He had 40 points but with three minutes left he exited the game. He is out for the rest of the rest of the series apparently. Now all, we have a similar situation actually in the Eastern Conference. Philadelphia beat Miami um, last night to take the seventh seed. Miami, though, is not out. They will play Chicago here to get the eighth seed. Uh, Chicago beat Atlanta uh, last night. Now, in this game, though, they will, the Miami Heat, though, will be without Jimmy Butler. He was actually injured last night with an MCL injury. He's going to be out for three weeks. So they're going to have a bit of a tough time beating Chicago and getting the eighth seed without Jimmy Butler. And looking at one of the teams already eliminated, the Golden State Warriors, they've won four of the last nine NBA titles. Is their dynasty over or can they be rebuilt this offseason? You know, I think a lot of people are wondering that. I really would say it's over unless they've got some kind of trick up their sleeve this offseason. They're in the unenviable position of having an aging contract or an aging roster with a ex bunch of expensive contracts. You know, Chris Paul is 38, Steph Curry is 35. Klay Thompson and Draymond Green, they're both 34. Those four players made a combined nearly $150 million last season. Now their first decision is going to be right here on Klay Thompson. He made $43 million last year. Um, but if he's going to come back, you would think it might be, would be at a reduced salary, possibly at a reduced role. That's going to be a major decision for them uh, to see if they can afford some other players too. But they, their options though are pretty limited with this, this expensive roster. Now there was a rumor though that they tried to trade for LeBron James in February at the trade deadline. Obviously it didn't work out here, but LeBron James actually has the power to become a free agent this summer. He has a player option for next year. Now that the Warriors have made their interest known, does he possibly decide to become a free agent this summer and possibly join them? If that happened, I would probably have to um, reconsider my, um, my analysis of them as a possible contender. Because if he goes on the team, that would be quite a uh, roster they would have. But that seems like a very remote possibility at this point. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tiff. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.